If you have a copy of God's Word, we'll turn to the book of Philippians, chapter 2. Philippians, chapter 2. We'll be reading verse 12 through 13, but we'll be focusing on verse 12 this morning. Philippians 2, starting in verse 12, the word says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I humbly come before you. Lord, I ask that our minds and our hearts and our ears will be open to hear and receive what you have to say to us. Lord, help us to see where we stand before you either those who are in Christ or those who are still in sin. Lord, also help us to see how we are living for Christ. If we are living in obedience, yielding our lives to your will, or whether we are trying to get away with everything that we can and still call ourselves a Christian. I pray, God, that you would reveal this truth to us and help us, Lord, to commit our lives truly under your great and mighty hand. It is in the great and glorious name of our Savior, Lord Jesus, and for his sake we pray. Amen. Having a three-year-old is sometimes a lot of fun. Sometimes it is a bit of a challenge. Last night, little Jason got quiet. And if it ever gets quiet in the Loggins home, it usually means trouble is afoot. Well, Bambi found why he had gotten quiet. He was in the bathroom. Now, Jason's been learning about pottying and washing hands and brushing teeth, and he's fascinated with the bathroom, especially two things in the bathroom. One is the toilet, and the other is the sink, both of which can create messes. Well, this time, fortunately, he was in the sink and not in the toilet, which was good. But somehow, and I'm not exactly sure how he did this, but somehow he had gotten water to go underneath the cabinet. And I'm not sure how this happened, but there were a number of rolls of toilet paper and paper towels that were stored underneath the sink. They were all fully saturated and ruined by the time Bambi found him. So we're talking about probably six rolls of a paper towel and probably eight or ten rolls of toilet paper. Gone. Well, his mother wasn't happy about this, so she decided to put him in time out. So she was being very patient and very kind with him, uh, not at all like her uh, husband would have done, but took him and put him in time out, which is when the room that I was in. And he's crying and he's sobbing and he's, oh, ho, 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 ho. Oh, so I stopped. I said, Jason, I was sitting in the room with him. And I said, Jason, did you do what mama said you did? He said, uh-huh, but I'm a good boy. I said, no, you're not. That's not what a good boy does. He didn't want to take responsibility for what he had done. He had probably cost us, my guess, about $10 in uh, paper products. We don't have $10 just to throw it in the trash. But Jason wanted to be a good boy. And he is a good boy most of the time. But the truth is that he did something wrong. And you know what? The truth is we do the same thing to God. We say, God, you know, I know I've made this mistake. I know I've messed up. But I'm a good boy. I'm one of yours. And so we take for granted the grace of God just as Jason took for granted the grace of his parents and what we do is we don't take responsibility for our obedience or our spiritual growth we don't take responsibility for our faith we just do what we want to do some things we'll be, a, we'll be a good boy in we'll be a good girl in obey Christ and other things we just don't care 
The truth is that we need to be responsible followers of Jesus. If you have made the decision to turn away from yourself and your sins and give your life to Christ by faith, do you know what that means? It means that you're supposed to give your life every day to him by faith. It means that you follow him. It means that we willingly yield our lives under his lordship. But too often we say, but God, I'm, I'm good in, the, in so many other ways. It's okay that I've got these areas that I'm not good in. This is the concern that Paul had for those in Philippi. Paul was greatly concerned. He knew them. He had spent time with them. But he wanted to make sure that they were following Christ and doing what they should be doing in obedience even while he was away. So he says these words, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as... In my presence, but much more in my absence. The truth is, is that so often when someone who we feel is some kind of authority is away, what do we do? We mess around. We goof off. You can probably think of when you were in elementary school and perhaps you had a substitute teacher. Definitely when you were in high school, I'm sure this happened to you. And the teacher's away, and you know what you're supposed to do normally in class. And the sub's there, and the sub may have uttered these words that I've heard subs utter. Well, what do you normally do? Those are some of the worst words I think a substitute can say. Because 99.9% .9 of kids are going to say what? Well, we don't really do anything. We just have a good time playing paper football or goofing around on our iPads. The truth is that when authority is away, we don't want to behave. We want to take advantage of every opportunity. Well, that was Paul's concern for the church of Philippi. He wanted to make sure that while he was away, they were being obedient to Christ. And the truth is, is that some of us sometimes feel like we can have opportunities just to do whatever we want. Maybe it's because nobody's around. Maybe it's because we're not at church. Maybe it's just when we're by ourselves, but we take opportunity to indulge the flesh. Paul didn't want them to do that. He was scared that they would do that, just as we should be scared of ourselves that we would do this, that when somehow we get an opportunity, then we can indulge what our heart craves for, and that is sin. You know, sin is only opportunity and desire that's what sin is if you don't have desire you won't do it if you don't have opportunity you won't do it but you have the desire in your heart and you have opportunity then you will indulge and you'll take the opportunities when no one's looking or which you can skirt by and hide or perhaps out in the open when authority isn't there or you refuse to accept authority the truth is we need to take responsibility for ourselves. Paul says here very clearly, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We are supposed to take responsibility for our own faith. We've got to be big boys and big girls who follow Jesus. When mom and dad's not around, when the preacher, deacon's not around, when Sunday school teacher's not around, that we're willing to be obedient to Jesus, obedient to his word and his will. We have to take responsibility for making sure that we are growing spiritually, that we are not infant Christians, in which we just simply occasionally consider Jesus and his will. Occasionally we'll study his word, but we'll have to be reminded again and again and again the basics of the Christian message. In the book of Hebrews, this is the problem that the author is writing to in Hebrews 5.11. About this, we have much more to say, and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have 
their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. There are too many infant Christians in churches today. Too many of us don't take our faith very seriously. We don't feel responsible for our own spiritual growth and obedience. We're messing around playing the game instead of being serious, committed followers of Christ. That's why the church in America is so worldly today. We have Christians who are babies. And they may be Christians for years and years and years, but they are babies spiritually. The author of Hebrews says that they need to take seriously God's word and use discernment to see good from evil. They need to really take in the truth so that they can live according to it. Too often, the only spiritual side of our life is an hour or two on Sunday morning when we come to church and our Bibles remain closed the rest of the week. Or if our Bibles are open, at least momentarily, our hearts are closed to receive truly what it has to say. We need to take seriously our own salvation. Paul says here, we're to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We are to work it out it doesn't say there that we're supposed to work in or work for our salvation or work up our salvation. He says to work out our salvation, to be responsible, to live it out, to let it permeate our lives and so saturate our hearts and minds that we are actually living in obedience, not out of legalism or fear that we won't have salvation, but we're allowing our salvation to be lived out in our lives. Alistair Begg put it this way. For a professing Christian to live in persistent and habitual disobedience was not only for Paul merely a sign of immaturity, it was for Paul an absolute absurdity. How can those who belong to an obedient Savior sit lightly to obedience themselves? We must be willing to obey such a great Savior. One who bled and died on our behalf. How could we see his obedience to the will of God the Father? His obedience to die for us so that we could be purchased from hell and death. How could we see his obedience and then say, it doesn't matter what I do. I'll take that for granted and I'll just live however I want to. Maybe you were sold a bill of goods that wasn't real. Perhaps you were sold this idea that you just have to believe Pray the sinner's prayer and get dunked in the baptistry and you're in. That's not gospel. Gospel is that we turn our lives over to Jesus by faith. That he owns us. And that means if he wants you to do something, by his grace you do it. It means if he wants you to stop doing something, by his grace you need to stop doing it. There shouldn't be a question. For if he has given you eternal life, if he has wiped your slate clean, how could you possibly withhold anything from him? He's given you all of eternity to be with him. How could you waste the days that he's given you today in sin and disobedience? We need to take responsibility. We need to be serious followers of Christ to put childish things away and to truly with a glad and sincere and joyful heart, put Christ first. A few things I want to share with you out of Scripture. And I'm going to go through these fairly quickly, so if you want to jot them down, they'll be, they'll be up on the, on the screen behind me. If we're going to take responsibility for our salvation, for our faith, we need to out of Romans 6, 1 through 4, we need to learn to live in grace. It says in Romans 6, 1, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who have died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised to, from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Paul was addressing in Romans chapter 6 the issue of, of having a cheap grace. Of which we think that because we are forgiven by grace and not by what we do, then we can do whatever we want to do. It doesn't matter what I do because I'm under grace. Paul says that this way of thinking is probably common. It may be common to some of us, but we can't do it. He says, by no means. For how can you, if you have died to self and sin and have given your lives to Christ by faith, how can you continue to live in sin? That Christ died and was resurrected, paying for our sins and giving us new life so that we could walk in following him. We have to learn how to walk, how to live in this grace. If you're going to take your faith responsibly, if you're going to take it seriously, then you have to learn to live in his grace. To learn to be obedient to him, not because you're afraid you're going to lose salvation, but be obedient to him because you don't want to take him for granted. Because you want to please the Savior, not please yourself. You need to learn to put Jesus above your own desires. It means that sometimes you have to deny yourself. Sometimes it's going to be costly, but you must be willing to say yes to Jesus all the time. And be willing to say no to yourself when your will doesn't match his will. This takes practice. This takes constant supervision of yourself and of your heart and your mind. This means that we have to learn to live in the freedom that Christ offers us. It means that we don't indulge in the freedom, but that we give grace and honor and obedience back to Jesus. Being willing to be obedient to him even though we can get by with it, being obedient to him, worshiping him with obedience rather than wasting, wasting the freedom he's given us on ourselves. Peter says in 1 Peter 2.16, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. We live in freedom in Christ. We don't have to be afraid of losing our salvation because we made one mistake we live in his grace, but we have to learn to be obedient in that grace. Not so that we can gain anything for ourselves, but so that we can glorify our Savior and live a life in close relationship with him. The second thing, over in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, we need to discipline ourselves. It says there in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified. The truth is that we need to be serious, spiritual athletes for Christ. We have to discipline ourselves using the spiritual disciplines of Scripture, whether it's coming to hear God's Word preached or whether it's preaching it to ourselves when we read it or whether it is going to a small group Bible study that we are saturated with the Scriptures, that we allow it into our minds and our hearts, that we let it so get in us that we can't shut it out. We also need to pray. You can read scripture all you want to, but if you don't have a serious prayer life, you're going to be weak spiritually. You need to learn to pray. Learn to pray with passion. Learn, as it says, to pray in the Spirit. Not where you're simply reciting a bunch of stuff to God, but where the Spirit is moving in you. That you're truly having this conversation with God in prayer. You need to learn to discipline yourself. What the youth have done this weekend in fasting is awesome. And I, and I don't think Brother Eddie talked much about the spiritual side of fasting, but it can be a powerful spiritual discipline. As you guys have went without food for something bigger than yourselves, going out of food, spending extra time in prayer, doing that as a spiritual discipline so that you can grow spiritually by taking control of your body. 
And by surrendering it, sacrificing it in a little way for Jesus, it reaps all kinds of powerful spiritual benefits. We need to be disciplined. We don't need to be novice Christians. We need to be committed, strong, vibrant followers of Christ. Ones that don't see following Jesus as a burden, but as a joy. As seeing reading scripture and praying and doing those things that will strengthen us, not as mere exercises in futility just to be chasing our tail, but serious exercises to do business with our Savior and our God. To see the benefits of bringing ourselves under the Lordship of Christ. Not just in a few areas of our life, but never giving up till every area of our mind and our body is under his lordship. We need to be disciplined. Three, in 2 Timothy 2, verse 3, we need to not get distracted away from Christ. So 2 Timothy 2, verse 3, share in sufferings as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No soldier gets uh, entangled in civilian pursuit since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. The truth is that so many times we're simply distracted. We're not focusing on God or his will or his purpose, but we're getting distracted by the many things that we live in and around. The truth is that we live in a place that is hostile to our Savior and wants to stop us from living from G for Jesus. The truth is, is that if you live like everyone else, you're going to live like everyone else. If you're chasing after the things of this world, don't be surprised when you're a very weak, empathetic Christian. If you indulge in every other way that those outside the body indulge in, whether it is in your entertainment choices, in your leisure activities, in your attendance to worship, if you look like them, you're going to be like them, whether you're redeemed or not. We must choose to live differently. And Paul says that we need to live like a good soldier who's not going to get entangled in the empty pursuits of the people around us. We belong to Jesus. We have to live like we belong to Jesus. We're not going to get distracted. We're not going to allow temporary discomforts distract us. We're not going to allow the, the things that people try to live for distract us. You know, the amazing thing is those in the military, pretty much in every branch, you go through boot camp. You go through a training time in which they're trying to make you into a soldier. And I've never been through boot camp before. I have not experienced that. I know some of you in this room have or you've had family that have. It's difficult. It's not easy. They don't try to make it real pleasurable and comfortable for you because they want to train you to ignore your circumstances ignore the discomfort and get the job done what we need to assess this do is to have some kind of a boot camp for Christians in which we ignore the difficulties of life and don't get distracted by them but that we continue to live for Jesus no matter what comes Sometimes it's not the bad things that distract us. Sometimes the bad things help us to get focused. What tends to be the biggest distraction is when things get easy. When things are really comfortable. That's when we tend to phone in our faith. And that's when we tend to mess things up. What we need to do is have the dedication and focus of a soldier. To say, I love Jesus, I live for Jesus. And if it's not according to his plan, if it's not in his word, I will not partake. I will not pursue those things. But I will live for my Savior. We have to be willing to work out our salvation in fear and in trembling. We need to have such a holy reverence for our Savior that we are afraid of displeasing him. That's what Paul says here. Since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Who enlisted us? Jesus Christ himself. Our aim needs to be to please him. And we need to be afraid of not pleasing him. Not because he might smite us with a bolt of lightning or something like that. But because we don't want to dishonor his name. We don't want to waste 
the time that he's given us. We don't want to look like a hypocrite and like such a feeble Christian. We don't want to leave people away from him, thinking that, that our half-hearted pursuit of Jesus is what Christianity is supposed to be like. We don't want to displease our Savior. We want to please him. The truth is, if we're going to take responsibility of our faith, we need to be willing to think and live like a soldier. Fourth, we need to choose obedience over sacrifice. In 1 Samuel 15, 22, it says, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. The truth is that so often we want to rely on sacrifice rather than obedience. We think, oh, God will forgive me. He'll forgive me, and he will forgive you. I want you to know that if you've messed up, he will forgive you. He'll cleanse you. He'll set you back on the narrow way just like that if you'll just turn away from it turn back to him he will forgive you he'll clean you up he'll help you to, to, to deal with whatever consequences of the sin that you have entangled in he will help you he loves you unconditionally but we should not rely on that unconditional love so that we're getting filthy with sin every week and then come to church and then somehow or another get cleansed week after week after week saying, God, you know, I've messed up again. God, I've messed up again. He will do that for the rest of your life and cleanse you. But we should not rely on that. We should live in obedience because then we can truly be used by him. We can truly bring him glory and honor. We shouldn't rely on the cleanup. We should strive to live in obedience so that we can truly bring him honor and glory so that we won't waste his grace or take it for granted. Knowing that when we mess up, he will forgive. And he'll help us through it. He is such a gracious and loving God. But the truth is that if you're a child of God, if you know Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit living within you, you have his word. There's really no excuse for not living according to his will and his power and his ability. It's not that hard. There may be a sin in your life in which you struggle over. You may need help, accountability, counseling, especially if it's an addictive sin. But you know what? We can, we can tackle that. We can help you. You don't have to keep living in that struggle of disobedience. You can have victory in Christ. He offers forgiveness. He offers his grace, but we need to try to walk in obedience for him. Not wasting, not using up, not having some kind of a halfway salvation, but living fully for him. 1 Peter 1, 14, it says, As obedient children, do not can be conformed to the passion of your former ignorance but as he who called you is holy you also be holy in all your conduct since it is written you shall be holy for I am holy and if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile in this time that we have this momentary age in which we live between our salvation and and either our death or Christ's return, we live in an opportunity to choose obedience, to choose to live for Jesus, to show that he means more to us than what this world has to offer, to choose to show that he is worthy of a life lived differently for. He'll forgive you when you mess up. And no matter how hard you try, you will mess up. But man, isn't it wonderful to live in the freedom of obedience? Where we can come before God and worship and praise and thanks and gratitude. In which we can truly praise him without that guilt or that shame of knowing that we failed him all week long. It is a sweet and wonderful place to be in when your heart is fully yielded to his lordship. So where are you at this morning? Are you truly taking responsibility for your faith? Are you striving to live for Christ? Are you working out your salvation with fear and trembling? Are you just getting by? 
limping along, just trying to make it, but not truly really trying to live for Christ. Perhaps the truth is that you've never given your life to Jesus to begin with. Maybe today is a day for you to come and know Jesus. Perhaps you've tried to live all these things, but you have missed the major point, which is that you belong to Christ. You've never made that decision to give it all to him. Perhaps today's the day in which you need to throw off everything else and just run to Jesus. Perhaps you are a Christian and you simply need to return to walk in obedience to him. You need to say, I don't want to be a spiritual baby anymore. I want to be a maturing follower of Christ. There is no such thing as a mature follower of Christ, but we are supposed to be maturing, learning how to live in his grace, learning how to walk each and every day for his glory, and saying no to what the world has to offer. Perhaps the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart. Perhaps there are things that you need to change things that you may need to confess before God. Maybe a decision that God's laying on your heart. You need to come grab Brother Eddie or me by the hand and we'll pray with you. We'll counsel you. will do whatever we need to do to help you. I don't know if God's speaking to your heart. But if he is, how will you respond? Will you say yes? And will you run to him? Or will you say no and run away? Will you please stand?